Make a date with Reverend Dr. Ebenezer Markwe at 6 a.m. from Monday to Saturday on Graphic Online via Facebook and YouTube as he expounds on matters of faith. Graphic Online, truth and accuracy every day. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. Benizam Makri of Living Streams International, bringing you Matters of Faith with Graphic Online. Living Streams will meet behind the Trade Fair, behind Zenith College, at the Life Cathedral, the Zoe Chapel of the Life Cathedral. Make a date with us on Sundays in the mornings for two services, that is 7 to 9 and uh, 10 to 12, and then on Wednesdays from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Make a date with us in the evening. Um, this morning, I would like to just capture my thoughts with yesterday teaches for tomorrow. Yesterday teaches for tomorrow. That is, yesterday will provide you teachers for tomorrow. In the book of Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 31, in the book of Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 31, the Bible said something that is very powerful and intriguing. Now the Bible says, now Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, I mean, who said, I and my Father are one. And Jesus who said, I mean, um, he's even coming to pray, and then he prays and then says, you know, uh, I'm not praying because of me, but I'm praying because of these people. Now Jesus, the Bible says, he goes on the mountain to pray, and he went, of course, with his three famous musketeers, um, Peter, James, and John. And then when they get to the, uh, the mountain to pray, the Bible says, and as he began to pray, the, 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 the fashion of his countenance changed, and then his raiment also changed. Now, that's another thing that we can look at later on. Now, the Bible says, and as he was praying, and then they realized that two people came to him, and those two people were, was Moses, and the other was Elijah. Now, the Bible says they came um, to talk to him, and the specificity of their, of their conversation was even mentioned, and they said, because they came to speak to him about his disease. That means about his death, about his departure from the face of this earth. Not to totally depart, but to go sit on the right hand of his father as depicted in scripture. Now, I was intrigued. First of all, I said, now they came to talk to him about his disease. And I'm talking about the disease, not in terms of disease with an S, but disease with a C. Um, that's like ceasefire, something like that. Yeah. Something that, that means his expiration, that means he was just going to expire. And they came to talk to him about that. And I was very, very, very surprised. I said, wow. Now, when they came, I'm, I'm wondering, why would they come to talk to him about um, um, uh, that thing? Now, they came to talk to him about some, a transaction that was going to take place, a divine transaction that was going to take place in his life about his death. And I said, but Jesus knew everything about his death. And Jesus even told us this thing, I would, uh, for this cause, the greater love has no man that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And he even told uh, the people that uh, uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. And then he, will, he, he kept talking about his death. I mean, so many times when he even told Peter that depart from me, get thee behind me, Satan, because he was talking about his death. So why are they coming to talk to him about his death? And then I realized something. First of all, we know theologically that Moses stood for the law because Moses was uh, known as the lawgiver. But Elijah stood for the prophets. And uh, I'm also very, very intrigued by another aspect of their lives. Are you aware that Moses was one of the people who raised a son or who raised somebody to take after him? Moses raised Joshua. Isaiah didn't raise sons to prophesy after him. Ezekiel didn't raise sons to prophesy after him. But what God wanted was for succession. So Isaiah didn't have any succession plan and uh, Ezekiel didn't have any succession plan. But Elijah, Elijah raised up a son called Elisha. If you remember, Elisha said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So Elisha was raised as a son and it was done by Elijah. And Moses also raised Joshua. Or Joshua as a son so if you if you look at it these people were now coming to talk 
to the son about a transaction that was going to take place. And it was a divine transaction. It was a divine mandate. It was a divine call. It was a divine service that the son of God. So the father was sitting down there and the father had some business and he's sending fathers to come to speak to his son to explain some things for him. And I began to say, wow. Now, what were they coming to explain? Two things was going to happen in Jesus' life. Two very powerful moments are going to happen in Jesus' life. And Moses and Elijah were people who were versed in those things and they knew what those two things, uh, those two things were. And so they came down to speak to Moses, uh, to speak to Jesus about it. Number one, Moses came to say to Jesus that, listen, it is not every prayer topic that God, your father, is going to entertain. It is not every prayer topic that your, um, your father is going to entertain. And what he was telling him that, listen, there's going to come a time you pray. I mean, you pray and your father won't answer you. You pray and your father won't answer you. And why am I saying this? If you remember, when Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, hit the rock. And God said to him, you will see the promised land, but you will never enter. Remember, Moses prayed, begged God, and God said, don't even make this a prayer topic anymore. Don't even pray about it. It is settled. I won't change my mind. I know people will be saying, wow. Yeah, some, it's not every prayer topic that God answers. And it's not under obligation to answer every prayer. That's what people think. No, and no, and no. Read the scriptures very carefully. Moses came to teach Jesus that, listen, there's going to come a time. You will pray, and your father will not answer the prayer. And you better stop praying and surrender to his will. So if you remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Moses was going to talk to him about the Garden of Gethsemane. That you are going to pray and you are going to say to your father, my dad, my father, take this cup away from me. And your father is not going to answer. You are going to plead, you are going to beg, take this cup away from me and your father is not going to answer. Rather, instead of praying for the cup to be taken away from you, you are going to drink the cup anyway. You know, But instead of praying for the cup to be taken away from, uh, from you, surrender to his will. So the day Jesus prayed, and he prayed, he said, take this cup, take this cup. Ah, then he remember, Moses told me that my father is not going to answer every prayer. So he said, you know what? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And one of the scriptures said, immediately he said, he surrendered to the will of God. Angels came down to minister to him. Whilst he was fighting and praying against the purposes of God, nothing happened. But when he surrendered to the will and the purposes of God, angels came to give him strength for the journey ahead. Angels came to give him strength for the, for, for, the, for the trauma that was ahead of him, for the difficulty that was ahead of him, for the pain that was ahead of him. Angels came to strengthen him. So, you know, Moses was sent to teach Jesus that it's not every prayer topic that your father is in. And the test of your maturity is not, is, is not being offended. You, you don't have to be offended because your father didn't answer, you know. And then Elijah. Elijah also came to teach Jesus that, listen, sometimes you're going to pray and look for your father in the earthquake and the thunder and the lightning and you're praying for something to happen. No. And when you pray looking for, for God in the thunder and the light, in the dramatic, you won't find God in the dramatic. But how are you going to find God? Remember, Elijah, when he was in despondency, running away from the threat of Jezebel and he was in despair. And he, he had cried and said, I'm not better than any of my fathers. Remember when God said to him, okay, now you step over here. I'm going to talk to you. The Bible says there was an earthquake and there was thunder, there was lightning, and the rocks were breaking and all those things. And the Bible says, but God was not in the earthquake or the thunder or the lightning. God was not in it. God was not in it. So guess what? In the dramatic, God was not in the dramatic, but still God spoke. How did God speak in the still, small voice? So Elijah came to teach Jesus that, listen, sometimes you'll be in situations where you are expecting a dramatic answer from God. You'll be in some situation where you, you're expecting some drama. God is not, he's not going to walk the pathway of drama. Rather, look deep inside yourself and listen to the still, small voice inside you. That was what he came to Jesus, so, to tell Jesus. So guess what? Jesus is hanging on the cross over there. And then he said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? 
I'm looking for you in the thunder. Step down and do something about my situation. It is too difficult for me. And he's looking for a dramatic response from God. But guess what? He was not in the drama. Then he said, listen to what he said. He said, even though I don't hear you, I, don't, I can't see you. I'm just hearing a voice in my inner mind that is saying it as well. So he says to his father, you know what? Into your hands I commend my spirit. So sometimes God wants us to listen to the still small voice inside us. The voice that sometimes can be drawn out by the drama that is outside. The voice that sometimes, you know, you need to, you need to, you need to withdraw. You need to be quiet in your spirit to hear. You, you need to silence every other voice that is outside, every other noise that is outside in order to hear him. Because sometimes the cacophony of noise around us is too much. And it becomes difficult for us to hear from him. So Elijah and Moses People of yesterday came to teach Jesus for the future. Isn't it interesting? Now here's the principle. Sometimes you may think you know everything. And sometimes you think you are it. But there's somebody in your yesterday. There's somebody in yesterday who knows something you don't know. Who has a key. Who has something that he can give to you. And that key will change your life forever. There's an Eli who holds a key for you to hear from God. There is, there is, a, there is an Elijah who must give you a mantle. There is, there, is a, um, there is a Moses who must speak into your life. There is, there is a, um, what do you call it? There is a David who must pass on a crown to you. There is a someone who must pour oil upon you. But all these people may be people of yesterday. And sometimes because of what you think you have or what you think you are, you think you are beyond instruction. People of yesterday cannot speak into your life. After all, if they had all, all that knowledge, and after all, if they had all that information, how come they never succeeded as you are succeeding now? That is the danger. Sometimes, yesterday has lessons for tomorrow. So in your today, listen to the people of yesterday. They have something to give to you. See you later.